What's, what's, the most, what's the most beneficial thing about the conference? Which part is the best? Where, 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 what part of the conference like, gives you the most information, the most, the most value? Sprints? Parties. Party? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? The whole way track. The whole way track. Exactly. Um, you know, when I, when I was preparing for this conference, I was like, I gave a similar talk two years ago. I know what I'm going to talk about. This time, I'm going to do my talk. I'm going to prepare it before I even sit on the plane. And I've really had this as a goal, and I did it. <laughs> I prepared a really nice slides, nice pictures, like good points. And then as the plane was speeding down the runway, I was like, oh, such a great idea. And I changed everything during the flight. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. And then, you know, being here for the last two days, especially yesterday evening with, uh, on the party, um, the same thing happened again. <laughs> so, and then I was thinking, you know, the whole way track is the most valuable uh, part of the conference. And is, is anybody using slides in the hallways? You know, do you, do you sit down behind a computer, they pop up the screen, and then they start showing you graphs and nice fonts and titles? No, you talk. So I thought, I, yeah, I, I threw up my, my digital slides up to the ceiling, said, fuck it, and let's do, a, let's do a talk without any slides. Let's make it a hallway track discussion. Um, in that light, if people would like to join here, there's like, I see at least 10 more chairs available over here. So, like, there are not going to be any slides, so you know, might as well be close. And I need to turn on my, my mic, I just remembered. <coughs> yes. Am I being heard? I am. Okay, cool. Start my clock. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, it's 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 the well if you, if you don't count the, the keynote, the first talk of, of the morning after the party. So I would like everybody uh, to stand up to get the the blood flowing. And this is also my idea of getting uh, of, of my way of getting the idea of what the audience is. So st keep standing up if you have deployed code to production in the last three months. Yeah, I was guessing. What about in like about last month? Like, still, last two weeks. Yes. <laughs> the week before the coming to the conference, have you deployed something to production? Still standing up. What about this week? Have you deployed something this week? <laughs> Can I say today? Yes, <laughs> cool. Yeah, you can you can sit down. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I like to I like to approach uh, things when I think about it with a mentality of uh, mentality that I stole from Tim Ferriss. Uh, how, what would this look like if it would be easy? So, you know, let's say that half of the people here did not deploy anything this month. Why? You know, is is code sitting on your computer? bringing value to your customer? Or is it when it's sitting in Git, does, do, do, do your customers have any good out of it? No, it's only when you give the code to, to them or, or, or you install it on your production servers do your customers actually get any value from you. And you know, if, if this is the only thing that actually brings value, why are we not doing it every single hour or every single day? Why, why do we wait two weeks, three weeks, maybe even months to get it out to customers? Um, and normally the, 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 the answer to that is because the deployments are painful, things go wrong, and we just don't want to do it. And you know, the, the longer period that, uh, that you, you're putting off some deployment, the harder it gets, and then it's even harder to get it started. Um, so how would this look like if it was easy? You know, imagine that you did some feature or some... Or some um, <coughs> some bug fix, and then at the exact moment where you had everything tested and you, you know it works, uh, the customer or whoever re reported a, a feature report uh, would just magically appear and you can just show them like how it is and they would say, yes, this is exactly what I need. You would press a button, boom, production, done. You know, that, that would be really cool, you know, because then you, can, then you can constantly bring value to your customers every day, several times a day. So another example for is, 
you know, when you get a uh, when you get a bug report, I know that uh, in the past uh, I've been running my company for ten years now, and the normal 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 response for a bug report was yes, thank you. Uh, we we have created a ticket, and uh, this will be fixed in the next uh, in the next release. Now imagine if you if you can reply to the customer, it's fixed. Just you know, can you check it out? Is this what you wanted? Wouldn't this be cool? You know, wouldn't the wouldn't your, wouldn't your clients be really happy about it? Because you know, when you for example, you, you have a fix and you have a, you have an issue tracker and you 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 push the fix and then in the issue tracker you say. Fix, a fix has been committed and it's waiting for a release, and then it's waiting for at least 10 days. Uh, te Non-technical people go like, what? Like, I, I, like wh why are you being such an asshole? If you have fixed it, wh why am I not getting the fix? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, I, it, it has been my, 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 my goal to get value to customers as fast as possible for the pa last couple of years, and uh, this is kind of my story of how we did it. Also, before we continue, uh, if there are any questions, please shoot immediately. Just you know, raise your hand, and we're gonna address them immediately. Um, before we go through the story, uh, let's also talk about uh, like Newton's first law. Newton's first law: the, the inertia. You know, the bigger the system is, the, the harder it is to move. Uh, like I said, it's the same with with deployments. Uh, the more time you wait with a deployment, the bigger it gets. The harder it's gonna be to deploy. The, the, the bugs, if you get any, any bugs, are going to be like, more severe. Uh, if, you're, if you need to do data migration and you just need and just do like a, and do it in really small chunks, they're manageable. They're quick, they're easy to revert. If you're waiting for the data migration, then you have to do several migrations in just one big pile, that's always going to break. I mean, most of the times. And it's going to be hard to test because it's going to run a long time and you're going to have a longer downtime, and it's going to be uh, more difficult to revert. So keeping things small is always uh, beneficial. The other uh, way that this first, uh, first Newton's law apply, uh, the law of inertia, is uh, team size. If, if you allow your developers to, uh, to deploy immediately to production, the team size shrinks, because otherwise you need, you need to have for, for one piece of code to get deployed, you need a developer, and then you need a QA person, and then you need someone to, a reviewer, and you know, you need all this process, and this process, again, takes time, makes deployments harder. Uh, so with, with keeping, with, with trying to optimize the entire process, you keep everything smaller, moving faster. And like, there and back, moving faster also means uh, you can revert faster if, some, if things go wrong. Um, so yeah, we have been, in the plumb consulting business for, for many years, and then we decided we we're going to start uh, building our own products. Uh, so we're not going to you know, do customer sites, but we're actually going to build our own software as a service products and then start selling them to, to, uh, to potential clients. Mm, and you know, at that point, I was the, like, the main developer. I, I was in charge of deployment. So we did them every two or three weeks. And sooner or later, I, I realized that this is something that could be automated. And just for the fun of it, uh, I hacked up a, a, a little script that, asks, that uh, listens for uh, GitHub webhooks. So whenever something is pushed to master, you can set GitHub to send a, like a post request to a certain URL. And I would listen to for, for that uh, post. And then what I would do is I would shut down Plone, uh, git, pull the latest, the, the git pull the latest code and configuration, rerun build out, restart Plone. And it was like really basic. I didn't think of it much until three months later when the script <laughs> fell and I was like, I haven't done a single deployment in three months. This is really great. Uh, and at that time I started to realize how great this is. Um, and the, from the, this, this has been a process in the last three years and uh, we now have the process much more sophisticated. But you know, I, I talked about the process two years ago uh, in Brazil. Uh, how to do it, and the talk is online. So if you if you need to know about specific tools that we use, you can either listen to that talk, or you c I can explain it later. But uh, I still want to uh, talk more about like why to even do it, um, and like how like th because the thing is, uh, tools are interchangeable. Everything is open source. And maybe you have a different different setup environment. Uh, it's uh, it's the idea of how to do it that matters. And I mean, you're smart people, you're going to figure it out 
what tool to use. We all know how to use Google. It doesn't make sense for me to, to list tools here. Um, so how our process looks now today is uh, we treat everything as a problem. So either it's a feature request, uh, it's, a, it's a bug report, it's a performance problem, it's a security problem. Everything is a single problem that lives inside a ticket. Uh, and then once a developer starts working on a, on a fix or a designer or whoever, uh, every problem has a solution. It doesn't have three possible solutions, it has one solution. One, that solution is a proposal in a, in a like in a, f in a form of a GitHub pull request. Again, you can use GitLab, whatever. Uh, just think uh, that you need to have one solution for a from proposed solution for a problem. And immediately when that solution is proposed, what we do is we actually copy the entire production environment and set it up on, on our staging infrastructure. We take the production data and we subset it. What that means is we take, uh, we take random rows from the data and we make sure that the data consistency is still there. So like if one row depends on the other row, we'll take both rows. Uh, and we also, we, we also don't take the entire data over. We, take, um, we, do, we run a logarithmic uh, um, function over it. So for example, if you have 10 rows in a table, the resulting table will have three rows. If you have 1 million rows, the resulting table will have 10,000 rows. So this significantly shortens the production data so the production database, but it's still very much like the production data that you run on the, on the staging uh, infrastructure. Uh, what we also do is we, we look in the code if there are any uh, database migration steps and we run those. Uh, and then finally, when this, when this staging architecture is up, we post the link to it inside the pull request. Uh, and that allows the, the reviewer, whoever requested the, uh, whoever uh, posted the problem, and then when, uh, when the proposed solution comes up, it allows, the, uh, it allows the person to just click on a URL and start browsing uh, the new code that runs against a subset of production, production data uh, with all the migration steps already applied. Um, and that really increases the feedback loop from you know, the reporters to, to developers or to designers, whoever. And, and it also, like, the thing is, it, it makes it very simple to test. You know, before, when I was reviewing pull requests, I saw like there was, this is just a simple pull request. I, I guess it's right. I'm not gonna, you know, I, no, normally I would pull the code uh, locally and then start a local instance and with the new code and maybe pull production data and click around to see if it works. But if it's just like five lines of code of, you know, maybe some CSS, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this works. You merge it and it fails. And it's always like that. And if you have, a, if, if you have already, everything already set up, you just click a link to see it, then you do it every time. So, you know, when people uh, ask me, but if, if, I, if I continuously uh, push code to production on every, on every merge, won't I get much lower quality? Actually, no, because you give the reviewer a ton of information, a ton of power to actually see if everything is right before you do it. Uh, obviously, we have 100% test coverage. Uh, we test for code quality. Uh, we do regression tests, uh, so performance tests. Uh, again, automatically inside every pull request. Um, the benefits are the customers get, get value immediately. And uh, like we have spoiled them with, with it. I know that mm -hmm. some, of, some of our customers, while we're still doing consulting on other projects, they started requ requesting continuous delivery on every other project because it just, for them, it seemed archaic to wait for a fix two weeks if, if it's already there. Like, why? Um, and th the other great benefit is to developers. Um, I, I have realized that if, if you allow, uh, like, especially when you're onboarding new team members, if you allow them to, to, uh, to push their code to production so their code is actually used from the beginning, they have like a much, uh, they, 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 they feel uh, an actual team member much sooner than they would be. I, I try to, whenever I, I, we, we hire a new person, I try to make sure that that person will deploy something to production on the very first day. Not like in three months, the very first day. I will prepare a very simple ticket or a few, and you know, maybe just some UI fix or something, and we would go through the entire process. And uh, the, it feels rewarding when you, when, you, you know, when you are able to do something really productive for the company the very first day you are there. You know, you set up your environment, 
you spend 15 minutes fixing a bug, maybe one hour, and then 20 minutes later, it's on production, people are using it. You know, tons, thousands and thousands of people are using it. And so keeping the developers happy is, I think, even a better benefit than keeping customers happy because, you know, it, you know, yeah, it follows one the other. Um, the second thing that happens with developers is um, uh, code ownership and, you know, um, the, they make sure that the, the code is better uh, because if you're in a process where you know that there will be two reviewers and then a QA team and then somebody is going to test before your code goes to production, you're like, I think that's good, you know, just, there's three more people who look at it, so probably it's okay. But if you know that once you submit this and there's just, you know, somebody is going to click around and, you know, there's not going to be a huge one week uh, testing period, uh, instead your code might be on the servers in the next 20 minutes, you're, you start to be careful what you, what you, what kind of pull requests do you do, like really careful. Because everybody knows who pushed the latest fix. You know, again, if you have a, a 100 commits stuck in a, in, a, in, a, in a single deploy and then something goes wrong and like everybody's like, yeah, it's probably not my code. And, you know, if you deploy on every commit, it's immediately known who was the one that, you know, that caused the, the production system to go down. And yeah, people are way more careful in such environments. Uh, how am I doing with time? Okay. Any questions yet? Shoot. You seem to have some very homogeneous uh, customers. I work for university, and if I change something in the production for one client, the other department shouts, no, we don't want that. We And so their discussion breaks up. We just, just simple things. So sometimes it's just labels we change, and the other one says, no, that's not what I, what I wanted to. So we have a very uh, complex review process mm. because people. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Our customer needs this. Do you have recommendations for, for this? So it's from the technical yeah. perspective, it's very easy. Yeah, yeah. I would love to do this kind of continuous deployment and mm. continuous integration, but the, the, the customer is not willing to do mm -hmm. this and able to do this. So Two things that you can do. Uh, one is if you have uh, like internal libraries that you use that are not like immediate, that they're like the, then the production system depend on them. You know, like if you have base packages or whatever internally released, you can use continuous uh, continuous de uh, delivery for them, for those libraries, and you deploy them to internal PyP servers like automatically. You can do this if you use them. The other thing is uh, start with very small projects, in unimportant projects, and uh, show that it works, and then. You know, use that as a as a good use case, and then try to move into the more mainstream things. That would be my my approach. But I know, yeah, it's I've worked for for universities as well. It it takes time and effort. I can just add here that you, you can uh, let the client decide the system requirements first. Once they are finalized, then you start working on them. So if they're finished, if they're not finalized. Sometimes you need to see it. So yeah. sometimes they, okay. at the moment they see it, they realize what they wish. So that's that's a little bit of, of, of a problem. Yeah. But th that's exactly what I'm saying. Like for every change that you do, deploy a staging environment with that change applied, and give your cust give uh, whoever your your customer is access to it, so they can see. And you know. And the problem is the one. Who requested the change yeah. says, "Okay, that's fine." Yeah. But th there is another one in another department mm. says, "Oh, wh why did you change that? I didn't request that. Mm. I, I didn't want that." Mm. So that's the problem. I, I you have conflicting hierarchies, and yeah. that needs to be fixed on the hierarchy level. So someone needs to be the one who makes a decision that a change might be okay, and the others will just have to live with it. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you can't. Treat it as a project, a product that is delivered to two uh, branches uh, at the same time. Yeah, but this is Switzerland. Everybody wants to. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe just, just like uh, maybe if you if you if you did you know several staging the, the environments for every small fix, that there would be less conflicts 
because it will be easier for them to check, like all the people that are involved, to check every single change. Maybe try with that. Yeah. I guess you mentioned, you know, the team member having responsibility by rolling out. Can we? Can we? Yeah. Can we use this? Test, test. Yeah. I was just wondering if you have an automated process for rolling back. If something goes wrong, or if that's still handled manually, or if you just always always apply a new commit to fix it, how do you handle mistakes? Yeah. Um, so most of the times you don't do rever you don't do uh, rollbacks. You just you know push a, a fix. Uh, some of the times it happens about maybe one once, maybe twice per year. Uh, I'm spoiled by Heroku. Uh, we host everything on Heroku, and Heroku basically, when you're in their highest paying tiers, uh, gives you a button. And if you if you, you do a deploy, something goes wrong. Uh, the thing is that with Heroku, until the build, uh, until they, the build uh, is successful, they will not even deploy it. So if something, you know, you, uh, you, you messed up the migration or you messed up build out or whatever, the code will not even get to the, to the production service. The old version will, start, will still run it. If the bug still somehow gets in and something is wrong, basically you click a button and they will re revert uh, to the previous version the code and the database because they do uh, minutely snapshots. So I'm spoiled by that. <laughs> you know, I, I'm always, uh, I always say that you know, our, we are here to bring value to customers, not to, host, uh, to, to do hosting. You know, there are companies that do hosting, do it well, and I, I'm, I don't want to be a hosting company. You know, I want to be a developer. So I make sure that uh, I get the best hosting I can for my money, which in my case is Heroku. But you know, there are plenty others. You know, if, if, you, if you're not in the business of hosting, don't do hosting. Yeah. Sure. Uh, two questions. Uh, team size, yeah. the current team size, and uh, are you doing clone on Heroku? Um, current team size 10 ish, okay. more or less. Uh, am I doing Plo on Heroku? Yeah, I mean, there are some tiny sites. But I want to, we, we have our own uh, kind of internal knowledge management system we have built with Plo. And I need, uh, I need to put that somewhere because we have it on a dedicated server that I want to deprecate. And I'm thinking of moving that over to Heroku. That's the, that's the $9 real, and real storage? Probably more. Yeah, can you just... <coughs> so when you do uh, one deploy per merge request, are you queuing the merge request up to go into your main deployment branch, or how do you handle that? Because we, I, I, for example, have 15 developers, right, that mm -hmm. all check into master at mm -hmm. four, and it takes four hours to go through all our QA checks, all mm -hmm. the security checks, mm -hmm. plus similar what you described, the uh, staging environment type things. And uh, people check in in the meantime. Right? Mm -hmm. and if, even if I would try to linearize that, mm -hmm. that would still go past 24 hours. So I, we would get a queue that never finishes. Yeah. Uh, so we never uh, push into master at all. Like nobody pushes into master. The only way to get code into the master is merging a pull request. Um, and there is another check on pull request that you have rebased your code to the latest master. So if there are two pull requests, you know, and they're both in the process, and then one gets merged, the other one will have will have to update the code. So some checks will still be valid, but some checks will have to repeat themselves. And the the, th the checks that will have to repeat themselves are the, the those that are running fast, which are tests and, and stuff. Uh, the general, you know, if if the UI looks good and if uh, from the security perspective, it's fine. That check uh, stays valid. Okay, but those, even those checks take hours for us because we run literally tens of thousands of permutations that we have to check. So, okay. Can they, so you yeah. linearize basically your, yeah. your merges into mass. That, that's yes. a philosophy yes. question. How you do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So, so you, you're small enough where you can still. Yeah. Listen yeah. Fair enough. I mean, small enough. Microservices? We have a ton of apps that are independent and then they talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, I don't want, uh, our build takes, whenever it gets over 10 minutes, I go berserk and then everybody, uh, like, we're getting it down to three minutes or four. 
Well, so we, for example, have to verify that everything runs on the browser. So just one single simulation for one process that we do mm. takes sometimes 10 minutes. We have mm. nine simulations for that process, mm. and we have 100 of those processes. So you, can't you run in parallel? Or you do? Well, we do. You do. But More hardware? Point, I mean, we run five times as many testing servers as we done on, on production. <laughs> at some point, you will have to cost benefit. Yeah. yeah. Trade off that you have to. No. That, that's a good point. We spend way more on, on, on staging and, and you know, the build servers than we do on production servers. Absolutely. Like way more. And production servers are peanuts compared to the infrastructure. We became Amazon's best friend within months. <laughs> cool. Any more questions? Okay. So, uh, like I was uh, saying to Tom, the, one, one of the approaches of how we went into continuous delivery was also to uh, make sure that the internal libs that we have, so code that we wrote or maybe just you know, internal releases of public packages, that we didn't release those by hand. Uh, so who uses Yarn MK release or Zest releaser? By hand? Why? <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a great package. I use it, but Travis runs it for me. You know, whenever there's a, I have Travis set up in a way when, when like for a, for a certain repository, if a new, uh, if if something, if a new tag is pushed, uh, it will recognize, oh hey, there's a tag, and it will uh, bundle up a release and push it to our internal pipi, pi, 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 pi. uh, Again, a thing that normally just takes you minutes, but you know, it 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 steals focus from you, and uh, you will make mistakes. Human make mistakes. It's and. and Computer scripts are normally more, more reliable from, from my experience. Um, so you can start with that. Like if you have any external packages that you use, uh, that you have an internal release of, make sure that those are uh, um, delivered continuously. So make sure that, every, for example, every time you push something to master, a new version is generated and, and pushed to your internal PyPI. Or maybe when you push a new tag, that is automatically generated. Um, and this will get you, in, like, getting into this continuous delivery uh, story and you will start to see benefits and uh, you, will, you, know, you will get the, uh, the battlefield experience that you need uh, to be able to do it. Yeah, uh, and then with apps, maybe start with a very small pyramid app on Heroku uh, because you know, pyramid is very simple to, to just get up and going and just do a side project or something like a helper app for your big plan sites and uh, use, uh, use Heroku. Heroku has fantastic integration with Git. Basically, when you create an app, you just say, I want to you know, uh, deploy from master on every change. And you have continuous delivery like that. And you, again, just to start playing with it and see how it goes. Um, yeah, I think so. We're, we're slowly running out of time. We still do have time for a few more questions. So if anybody has any more questions, now is the time to shoot. Okay, yeah. Where where's the mic? Thank you. Uh, so what you're saying is that's great for small fixes, pushing bug fixes um, to production immediately. But what about features, um, particularly massive massive features that um, are hard to develop incrementally? Like the the, the whole feature mm -hmm. really only makes sense if if a certain amount of pieces are in place. I'm guessing your answer will be feature flagging, um, like disabling the feature for the, for the customer side, but then what's, what's the point in pushing it to production if that, that code path is never actually hit and the, the code isn't being used? How, how do you deal with that? So we do have big features to deploy as well. And yes, we use feature flagging for that. Uh, it's not true that the code is not being hit. The code is being hit by like 10 or 20 percent of the people, depend on how you, you, know, you set the criteria. So feature flagging is you have, a new, for example, a, a completely new UI. Um, and uh, you, 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 you write code in a way that it's only displayed for a certain amount of people or a certain group of people. And you, when you push that to production, you actually have to um, um, like two systems running side, side by two UIs running side by side, and if like if it's really bad, you can you can just you know switch that uh, criteria who gets to see it, and then everybody still gets the old UI. Or you can after a week adjust it, and then more people and more people and more people start getting the new UI. But that does not really have 
any, you know, it's, the, it's not about continuous delivery. You can do that with manual yeah. deployments as well. So, um, the, w w w so big features, you know, you said big features, they're hard to develop. Again, that's not, I mean, the point of continuous delivery is that, is that you don't do uh, manual deployments because those will break. So even if you have a huge feature, and like we do a lot, um, the thing is that as you develop, as you, as you propose a solution inside a pull request, then your entire migration steps, everything will be run and set up on a new, ser on, on a new, on a staging server. You can, you can see if there are any performance uh, regressions. You can see if you're, you actually test your, uh, all your migration steps every time you commit inside a pull request, you know. It's not like, you know, when you do it manually, you, you test your migrations and everything is fine and the customer sees it and yeah, maybe we fix this and this and that and you also fix that and you'll say, oh fuck, the, the testing migrations will take me two hours. I guess it's fine, you know. But if it's done automatically, it's done on every time you do changes to, to the pull request. So it's only about automating uh, things that you would do manually, even if it's a huge feature. So uh, that would mean um, you do actually do massive pull requests that that just gets pushed automatically. Yes. Okay. I mean, after every, all the checks are done and everything else, yeah. We have like, we, we've had a, a big feature in one of our main systems that we were developing it for over three months. It's still being developed and then on every change there's still, you know, still a staging gap goes up and, yeah. Philip? Okay. Uh, where's the mic? As a developer, I mean, it's really hard to write the unit tests all the time. Because sometimes the client needs to fix pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle those situations? Like, okay, really busy time and you just deploy the code and forget to write the unit test or robot test. Uh, so that, uh, write the test first. Write the test first. Then, I mean, sometimes really emergency cases, uh, how, you, how do you handle those situations? Okay. To write a test, it takes time. That's for sure. Yeah, I always write a test to confirm that the bug is, is there and then to confirm that I have removed it. Just, yeah. I mean, not entirely like write the test first, but I will never push code without writing a test. It's just no, not going to happen. No, I've, I've, I've did it a few times and every time that I did it without a test, I broke something. I was like, it doesn't make sense. I, I might as well spend 20 more minutes now than two hours when, when I break the production data and I have to do a full restore of, of, yeah. of this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a similar problem and we have a second way of deploying hot fixes that way. Because if the customer is down, reaction time trumps everything mm -hmm. and we don't have three hours to wait for our checks to come back. Mm -hmm. So we do hot deploys that go on where we circumvent all our mm -hmm. infrastructure. Yeah, you can have that. Uh, you can have a second uh, process. That is. But that's not normal, and then mm. that is checked for. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, one of the way of mitigating this is uh, maybe s maybe look at uh, how Heroku is doing. So what they do is when you push code, they will actually uh, uh, they will make a, a zip of build of like, they build a code and then make a zip out of it and then keep the zip, and then. Uh, Whenever you need uh, a new node up, or like, they will like, take a fresh server and then take that zip, decompress it, and run it. Mm -hmm. So even if that node goes down, you have everything built already. You just you know just pop up a new node and just take the. We do the same with, with reels, basically. Yeah. You take the time to build the reels to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think this is it then, and we're on time. Yay! Thank you.